things. Amen? Amen. Can you just stand with me, amen, this morning? Um, I'm excited. I'm nervous. I'm anxious. I am messed up um, because I, uh, you know, and, and, I, and, I'm, and I welcome the challenge that God is putting before me and, and, uh, and, and speaking more. And, um, but this word this week is like, God, where are you doing? Um, and as we're coming out of our series of evidence, we come into the series of um, life cycle. Thank you. Thank you. Life cycle. Um, and this morning, I get to touch on the subject of life after death. But it's not what you're thinking. You know, in order for us to reach our destiny, there has to be two deaths that happen in our life. We have to realize that. And it's not only the death of Jesus Christ on the cross that gets us into heaven, but there's a death that has to happen inside ourselves, to ourselves, to be able to live out our destiny. And that's the word that we're speaking on this morning. Something has to die in order for you and I to live. Amen. And I'm going to be reading this morning out of Romans chapter 7. God says, I'll be reading from the New King James, I'm not sure which one to put up there, but just follow along. Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Something has to die this morning. And some of us have been having an affair with our Christian relationship. We tease, we come and flirt with God on Sundays. But Friday night and Saturday night, Lord help me. Lord God, I pray and I thank you for the opportunity to share your word this, this morning. Lord God, I am just your vessel, Lord. Use me, Lord. I come, I come before your presence, Lord. I'll get a choke will be done, Lord God. And that lives will be free, lives will be transformed by the power of your word, Lord God. Yes, Lord. Uh, God, because today we live, Lord, because you died, Lord. Yes, Lord. And you rose again. Yes, Lord. Lord God, we thank you for that, Lord. And yes. today, Lord God, our hope and our prayer that our commitment will be renewed, Lord God, yes, steadfast yes. to yes, follow Lord. you. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' name, Lord. amen. Yes. amen. Yes. Yes. Also, a quick announcement. The The men are going to be setting up their conference, and that's going to be weekend of June the 17th, I believe. I was out with uh, Brother Jesse this week, and picking out the place, and we're just excited for what God is doing um, with the men. I'm sorry, bear with me, I just lost my notes here. I can't find them. Um, now I can't open the page. God, amen. 
So the scripture we read here this morning, it, you know, a lot of times in life, we want things to line up accordingly for us to uh, start working and fulfilling God's plan. And we want things to line up accordingly. And we know the Apostle Paul to be one of the greatest, if not the greatest, Apostle in the Word. Amen? And, and sometimes we, we, we ourselves, we, we hear this right a lot. We say, well, you know, I'm waiting for things to get right. You know, I'm waiting for everything to kind of work itself out before I begin to move, before I begin to do anything. Amen? And it is important for us to know that today, the, the situations for Paul were not the most ideal situations. Paul did not come, you know, escorted by a chariot, you know, of white horses. He did not come to speak to the Romans in the Colosseum. No. He came to Rome. He came back home in chains. He came back home a prisoner. Not the most ideal situation for the man. And see, it is the people that decide to move no matter what their situation is, those are the people that are radical people. Those are people that are going to make changes. Those people that are not waiting for things to get right, but those people that are moving. And because they are moving, things are changing. And that should be our ideal. That should be our desire to follow Paul, amen, this morning. To be radical as he is. The Apostle Paul comes to Rome, and he begins to minister to Rome. And for the most part, Rome is a very heathenist, heathenistic place, full of sin, full of uh, people worshiping false gods and idols. Greek mythology was running rampant during this time. And they had no respect, they had no regard for God, yet alone someone who loved him. So I want to paint a picture this morning before we get in. So this is what God was, this is what God was preparing Paul to encounter. Yet, in such a huge city, here comes this Orthodox Jew to come minister. And all of, these, all of these different religions, all of these different things converging on one city. And Paul comes to minister to them at this time as a, as a, as a citizen of Rome. He comes, to, he comes to minister to them as an inmate. But he also comes ministering to them as someone who now is convinced that Jesus Christ is Lord for the glory of God. He comes in transformed, a new creation, a new transformation has happened to Paul. And now Paul understands his mission. Paul understands what he is called to do. See, sometimes it takes us a while to understand our, what our mission is. And I'm talking about us here today. We live a while before we truly realize who we really are. It takes us some time. But now he knows that God has sent him here to speak to the Gentiles. And this is a tough job for an Orthodox Jew. This is a tough job for an Orthodox Jew to wrap their mind around. That God would want to save such a historically lost people. And then as a Jew, there, there's going to be that struggle. Why would God want to save a Gentile? They're heathens. They're not from the seed of Abraham. They have not kept the religious practices. They have not kept the religious ceremonies. They are hateful. They have no rich religious traditions. And they relentlessly worship false idols and gods. Worshiping their flesh and their physical need was their number one goal. Some of the most perverse sexual acts that we know today originated in Rome during this time. And here, God sent Paul there to preach to them. And we would think that his greatest challenge would be to convince them of the power of God. But no, Paul's greatest challenge right here and right now would be to convince, convince the, the Jews that God has a heart, that God has a desire to save such a people, even though they may not understand it. How can he save them? How can God actually want to put them on equal status with the Jews? The Jews have done 
everything they can to keep the law. The Jews have, have had left their, lived their lives in virtue and honor. They have, they have been careful to follow the law to the day. And how could now God, in a turn of events, save someone who has kept nothing and broken all the laws, who had been promiscuous and perverted? How dare God raise the status of someone who has turned their back on him and been rebellion and lived their life as they wished for so long? Does it sound familiar? Thank God for his grace, amen? amen. See, most of the book of Romans is spent explaining the grace of God. Now, to explain the grace of God is kind of an oxymoron, honestly. How can you explain the unexplainable? Amen? Do, we, do you really understand the grace of God? If you stop for a moment and reflect on your own life and think about how God's grace has saved you, do we really deserve it? Would you really grant someone who has caused you the same equal pain or suffering that you've caused God the same grace that God has granted you? It's hard to understand that. But Paul goes all the way back to Abraham to remind them of the father of their faith. And, they, and you have to consider that God entered into a covenant with Abraham long before he had committed to Jehovah. Before he was circumcised, he was already in covenant with God. God already had made the covenant with him. The circumcision was a sign of the covenant. It was not the covenant. We have to understand that. The cutting away of the flesh is a sign of, a, of the covenant. It's a result of the covenant that God made. Us dying to our flesh is a result of the covenant that God has made with you and I. Let's look at this very carefully. If we think about this, the father of the entire Jewish movement was indeed historically a Gentile. If we go all the, back, all the way back, we see this. And we have to think, who else but God can make something out of nothing to work out and make it into something that he could work with all because he said it to be. It is only by the grace of God. It is like God standing out, as it says at the beginning of the, in, in Genesis, when he stepped out into the darkness, when he stepped out into the blackness and said, let there be light. Out of nothing, light came. And that is the power of God. And now Paul is saying, how dare you forget where you've come from and turn your nose up at these people. He's reminding them that God has a way of taking nothing and making something out of it and setting it free. It is the grace of God, the unmerited favor of God that allows worthless and unworthy people like you and I to be counted as righteous even though we don't deserve it. The grace of God is so powerful. See, grace doesn't just hang around here at the church. No, no. No, we have to be clear with that. Grace doesn't just hang around here. Grace is, grace is at your home. Grace is in your job. God's grace is even at the club, God's grace is with you at school. God's grace is wherever you may go. God's grace is with you. God's grace is there. God's grace is not only for the church. How do you, how do you think you got to church? God's grace. It was God's grace, grace that brought you here. See, we, we have held on that, oh no, the God, God's grace is only for those that walk through the door. No, we have to realize that God's grace extends beyond. And because of that, you and I, some of us with our testimony that some people walk in here would be amazed to see you and I worshiping God. And that is God's grace. Because Amen. God's grace went down somewhere, somewhere dark and dirty and rescued us. Amen. Amen. Grace is unexplainable. And the results of grace are just that amazing. Amen. Grace brings us peace. Therefore, being justified with, by grace, by faith, we have peace with God. Now, there are three types of peace. There's the peace of God, there's the peace in God, and there's the peace with God. The peace of God is a peace that comes from you, from within you. You don't understand it. You know yourself, and even other people around you, they may be surprised at how you react to certain situations. And even you surprise yourself how you react to certain situations. And that is the peace of God that is living within you, that surpasses all understanding. That peace that is operating within you. 
So it's not just the people around you that are being surprised, but you yourself are surprised. Man, what is, what, what? Last week I probably was reacting a little bit differently to this. But something's different. Something's changed. Thank God for his grace. Then there's the peace within God. And that's the peace that I get when I worship my way into his presence. That's the peace that I get when there may be hell and high water all the way around me, but I have to press in to the presence of God, no matter what my situation is, no matter what may be going in. See, I, that's why I'm a worshiper. I'm not emotional. I am. But I, it's because I want to press into the presence of God. I want to get to that place where nothing else matters. Amen. I'm not worried about my half crazy boss tomorrow. No, I'm worried about Amen. just being in the midst of the presence of God. Amen. And that's why we have to press in. That's why we, we in the midst of our worship. As Sister Amadi said, when we think about the love of God and the pursuer of our souls, man, no matter what's going on around you, man, you just can't help but just Surrender yourself and worship. In that presence, you have peace. Amen. Amen. That's why, that's why, that's why you see so many people get emotional because you think about you think about what God has rescued you from. Amen. You think about where God has brought you from. Yes, Lord. I remember when I first walked in the U-turn and Larry, Pastor Larry, every Sunday was singing Brad Lee. And, he, and I'm like, man, someone give that brother a hug. <laughs> but then I heard his story. Then I heard his story. Then I understood why he was worshiping the way he was worshiping. And don't you dare ask God, man, God, I don't want to worship like Larry. Look, man, I don't want to worship. Don't you dare. Because Larry had to go through some stuff. I had to go through some stuff, man, to get to where I'm at. Amen. If you have your story. You can worship yeah, in your God. situation in the midst of whatever's going on in your life. In yeah. your life, you have the freedom to worship God. Yeah. 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 You have to press in. You have to press into the presence of God. Sometimes you have to press in because in the presence of God is where the devil can't get you. In the presence of God, your depression can't come in with you. In the presence of God, your sickness can't come in with you. You have to press into the presence of God. Because there is healing there. In the fifth chapter of Romans, he's not talking about this peace, but he's, he's talking about the peace with God. See, that part of me that was at war with God at one point in my life, my flesh, my human nature, that, that nature is, is naturally at conflict with God since then. one. He says, I have peace with God. No longer hiding, no longer running, no longer ducking or hiding from his will, surrendering to him. Isn't it amazing that someone that ran so far from the presence of God in a world whirlwind of sin, now seeking that God means to run from it? Because now we have peace with God. Amen. There's a grace. There's such a grace. There's such, there's such a peace within the grace of God. Amen. And the grace he teaches here is, over, is so overwhelming that it leads him to have to write in the sixth <laughs> chapter something that if he didn't write it, Perhaps you and I would have lost our minds with everything, the freedom. Because at the time he finishes chapter 5, he says, Let us understand that it's not by works, but by faith, so that no man can boast, but it's a gift from God. It is not by anything you did or I deserve. And some people would take that as a license to sin. But it's not. It's because God grants this as righteousness towards you and towards me. It's a gift, even though we are not right. Grace is so awesome that it says that by one man sin entered the world, and we were all born into that sin. We did not sin like Adam, but because of Adam's sin, we were born into sin. See, God's problem is with you is not what you did. See, if you hadn't done anything wrong, we were still all, you and I, born into sin. It's not the act of sin. It's the state of being born into it without doing it, going to hell without causing it living in shame. By one man, sin came into the world. But let me tell you, 
If you understand that, then the Word of God also says, and we have to understand, that Christ Jesus' righteousness came into the world, and you received righteousness you didn't deserve. You didn't even earn it. It is given to you freely. Amen. So by one man, sin came in. But by one man, we have freedom today, and we got to give a praise. Amen. 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 It's such a beautiful gift that the angels right now are worshiping the God that we love and saying worthy is the Lamb. I don't have to sing. I don't have to write. I'm gifted. I'm gifted with salvation. I'm gifted with eternal life. Not because I deserved it, but because he granted it towards me. Thank you, Lord. So the grace he was talking about in grace in chapter 5 is so overwhelming that he writes this in chapter 6. Shall we now continue to sin that grace may abound? Because in chapter 5, he's taken away the need for works and all. But unless you and I use the grace of God as a crutch for our sin, God help us. He had to pick up the pen and write this. Shall we continue to sin so that grace may abound? So that grace may increase? And very clearly, he wrote it. God forbid. God forbid. You must do it. You might do it. But God won't let you rest in it. No. If you could rest in it, then you wouldn't mind it in the first place. Amen. Pa uh, Pastor Sylvester was saying, sharing this morning, and I, and I wanted to use it. A pig falls into the mud and loves it, wobbles in it, starts running around, rubbing itself, enjoying itself like it's a party. But a sheep falls into the mud and begins to cry, begins to struggle, and wants to get out of it. It's the same mud, but it's a different nature. See, if, 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 if you rest in the mud, you're a pig. But if you're a child of God, you might fall into it. You might fall into it, but you're going to start crying out to God. You're not going to be comfortable in it. You're going to want to get out because that is not in your nature. Amen? Amen? So he says, shall we continue to live in sin so that grace may abound? How can we that are dead to sin live there any longer? How can we that are dead to sin live there any longer? We have to die so that something can live. Just like a seed is planted in the ground, that seed has to die. It dries out, but eventually it bears fruit. It bears through something through its dying, through its death. And that's what the sixth chapter brings, that word death. This is why when we baptize you, we declare that that old person is now dead. It is a declaration to every demon to every stronghold, to every person that ever attacked you and accused you, that that old person is dead, that all debts to your sin are now canceled because of your decision to be baptized, because you are, have been, declared yourself to be dead with Christ and rising in him. Amen. Amen. And then in chapter 7, he starts talking about marriage. He brings along this subject, but here, here's where we're going to get to our point because he's appealing to them in this chapter that according to their teaching, if you are married, as it says, it uses the reference, she is married to a man and she's not free to be with another man while that man lives, she will be called an adulterer. Unless the old man is dead, she is free to marry. God is clear that he hates divorce. He hates divorce. You have to be clear with him. I wouldn't do myself justice and do the word of God justice if we didn't preface that. I don't want anybody to misunderstand that. Amen. And there were things that happened that all of a sudden, when in the time of Moses, because of the hardness of sin, that it was allowed. But it was only because of the hardness of sin. Marriage from a biblical perspective, though, if we look at it as a metaphor, if we look at marriage today, in a biblical perspective, it is a metaphor of Christ's relationship with the church. So in reality, if we stop to think about it, those of us that are married are playing a role in an illustrated sermon for Jesus Christ. Fulfilling the role that Jesus has called for us. Amen? According to the text, what the Word of God says. See, there are certain implications right in our Bibles. It says, to death do us part for better or worse, for richer or poor, in sickness and in health, because we are committing to a covenant that shadows the same covenant that Christ has done with the church. 
See, Christ is saying, I take you to be mine. If you're better or you're worse, whether you're sick or whether you're well, I'm going to be with you, and I'm going to be yours in season and out of season. I covenant with you, and I promise to be with you throughout this process. That is the covenant that God has made with you and I. That is why the Bible says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And, and let me tell you that Christ didn't really get a fair shake with the church. Because if I put it to you in, in modern terms, I'm going to stand over here so I'm not looking at my wife. <laughs> but it's like, it's like you, or, you or I being married to a man or a woman that is sometimes in and sometimes out. This is what God is experiencing in his relationship with you and me. It's, it's like if you and I were married to a crazy woman or a crazy man that is sometimes in, sometimes out, sometimes in the mood, and sometimes not ready. Yet he has to love you and I anyway. He has no choice. We thank him for his grace. But Paul didn't come and change to Rome to give a marriage conference. No. He's teaching and explaining very key point. He wanted to paint a picture here and explain how God could be married to you and I, the New Testament church, and yet in his word it said that he was married to Israel. Well, Paul is telling us that in order for God to be married to you and I, the New Testament church that is written, that is written in the law, the only way was for him to die. That was the only way. He had to die to fulfill the law. He had to die to complete the law. When he died, I want to skip back the part where the, the Bible says the sun hit his face. I want to go beyond the part where the ground began to get nervous. No, I want to get to the part where the word of God says that the veil was torn and access was granted. It was torn and we had an opening, unworthy as we are, but he tore open the way so that people like you and I that are unworthy could come boldly to the throne of grace and say, find mercy in a time of help and need before God's feet. Thank you. That is the power of God as he died and that veil was torn. He Thank died you. so that the law could be fulfilled. And now the law rests in the measures of the sacrifice and grace. Because you and I were married. He escalates the conversation. He says, in order for you, as he says in Romans 7, he says, in order for you to fully walk in the grace that is given to you, you have to die too. And that's our point today. We have to die to ourselves because you and I were born into our old human nature. We were born into our old habits, our old lust. We were born into our old desires. We were born into our old appetite. We were controlled by the old man. Let me use the example, and, and I read this a couple weeks ago with, with, uh, with Pastor, and we were talking about the story of Abigail before. Everybody knows Abigail as the eventual wife of David. But let me tell you, before she was married to David, she was married. <clears throat> Abigail was married to Nabal, but had her eyes on David. But they couldn't hook up because Nabal was in the way. Now, I want you to understand the meaning of the name Nabal. I want you to get this. Nabal means fool, senseless. So Abigail, in other words, was married to a fool. <laughs> Don't look to your side. <laughs> now I want you to get this though. She was attracted to a king in David, but married to a fool. What do you do when you're attracted to a king, but you're married to a fool? She kept that looking at David, just like some of you and I Keep on coming to church and flirting with God. We come to church on a Sunday, we wink at God. <laughs> Some of us even cry. <coughs> but then when we leave here, we're still married to the fool. We're still married to the census. We're still married to that which has no meaning. We come back and forth still bound to that. She kept looking at David. She kept looking. She, she, we come and we 
flirt with being a Christian. We, we're not all in. We come, we, we, we go through the motions. But on Monday morning, when we get to work, we fall into the same routine, talking as dirty as, as an R-rated movie. I am not a fan of Facebook. I am not a fan of Facebook. And let me tell you something. Some of, some of us, say it clearly, are guilty. And, and, and I, I, I get to a point where I hide in people's posts. Because I see the posts on Friday and Saturday night. And then I see you on Sunday coming up here. Oh, God, help me. And you're a Abigail kept looking. Sometimes you don't know. Sometimes you don't know. Sometimes we don't realize that the old man is a fool until we lay eyes on the king and it's revealed to us. See, we talked about that in evidence last four weeks, that God will begin to reveal things to you when you're in his presence. And when we look at the king and we look at Nabal, but when we look at the king and we look at the foolish things, or better yet, when we look at the risen king and you look at the foolish things you're holding on to, you come to a point that you say, I used to live like a fool. The way I used to think was like a fool. But Abigail was hot until Nabal died. And when he died, that freed her from her bondage. So let me tell you, church, the old man you were married to, the old man you were, that old man that was holding you back, that fool that you used to be, that weak person that you used to be, is dead. And the Bible says, when the old man is dead, you are free. When you get free, what used to hold you can't hold you anymore. When you get free, what used to bind you can't bind you anymore. See, you remember a time when you couldn't control yourself. You remember a time when you couldn't lose yourself from those things. But the old man is dead, church, today. We have to realize that, and we have to declare that in our lives. Amen? Amen? And the Bible says that he who the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen. Tell your problem that it's over. Tell the old man that it's dead. Drugs can't hold you. Sin can't hold you. Suicide can't hold you. The old man is dead. Something has to die in order for you and I to live. Amen. We have to grasp that. Amen. Amen. I love the song, and I was talking to my daughter last night. The worship, the worship song, the praise song. Nothing's gonna hold me back. My chains fell off, and now I'm free. I'm alive to live in you. I'm alive to live for you. Amazing grace, how can it be that you gave everything for me, and now I'm free to live? Now I'm free to give. I'm free to worship. I'm not going to hold anything back. That has to be our mentality, church. He gave it all. You have to come to a point that you say, God, you sacrificed it all for me. You pursued me to the point where you gave it all. So now, let me, you died so I can live. So God, let me now die to myself so that I could partner with you in death and live with you in my resurrection. We have to praise him for that, amen, this morning. We have to stop. Some of us have to stop trying to save the old man. Still holding on to that old man. Giving it life support. Still holding on to it. I'm not here to judge. I'm here to re relate with you because that was me seven years ago. Amen. I wanted the freedom that, I, that, that was promised to me in Christ. But there was still a part of me that was holding on to the old man. There was a part of me that was still holding on to the old ways. And I had to come to a point that I truly recognized that old man to be dead and for me to be set free. You have to come to that point because God has promised us a resurrection and a brand new life. And I'm going to close with this. I want you to know who you were is dead. Who you were is dead. 
Amen. And some of you may be asking, if that person is dead, to be dead, we are stuck with his word. And we cannot bury it, we want it. When you recognize your old man to be dead, you are finally free to marry your destiny. Because it is promised to God. The only thing stopping you from living in your destiny change our history. It's a part of us. It's part of your testimony. But we have to recognize it to be dead. We have to say that that was then and this is now. I am a new creation. I'm holding on to your promises and your mission. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death, yes, Lord. the gift of God is eternal life yes. through my spirit. You have to come to a point when you, when you settle an account and those of you that reconcile your accounts and your checkbooks and you have to come to a point where everything kind of cancels out, right? When you reconcile everything, right? As an account, it doesn't always make sense because sometimes everything just adds up to zero. Right? When you're balancing out the, the accounts, right? Ed? We have to come to a point where we reckon Reconcile that account. And I'm sorry, this is the nerd accountant in me. But we have to come to a point where we reconcile that old account and count it as zero. Yes, Lord. We make that choice. You and I. See that see some of us, some of us, and, and my prayer is that we don't we don't walk out of here that See, some of some of us right now are gonna have our greatest battle. Because the devil's happy when he's single. It doesn't bother him. It doesn't bother him. If you're still married to the old man, it doesn't bother him that you came in here and sang a worship. It doesn't bother him that you took part in communion. It doesn't bother him. Amen. What does bother him is when you just make a decision to change and let go of the old man. Mm -hmm. Amen. When you decide to take that step of faith, that's when hell begins to get nervous. That's when the demons begin to be, be nervous. Those things that are tormenting you, that's when they begin to be nervous. When you decide to take that step of faith and say, you know what, I'm no longer going to be married to those foolish things. I'm going to make a decision to reconcile that count as zero. See, for, for those of us that have taken that step of faith and been baptized, when you were baptized, when we baptized you, we declared that we meant to be dead. That that was settled. It was done. Don't let the enemy be in your ear. When you walk out of here, having you re revert back to your old ways, revert back to your old habits. God wants so much more for you. God wants so much more for you and I. It says in Psalms, you were fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. God's craftsmanship in you and I is so wonderful. But we have to come to a decision. We have to come to a point where we say, you know what, I'm going to let go of the old man. No matter what my friends may say, no matter who may talk about me, no matter if when I'm here worshiping God, people are going to criticize me and say, that guy's a fool. No, no, I was a fool. And now I'm married to the king. Amen. Amen. we got to get to that point. Some people are going to call you phony because they knew who you were. Amen. Some people are going to call you phony. But you got to let that go. Amen. And let me tell you, it, it's not only sin. Rebellion, anger. Yes, Lord. Yeah. 
I don't want to let go of this anger. I want to stay resentful. fault in anybody that has failed you because he has it. Amen. God has no fault in that person that's stacked in the back. Amen. Because let me tell you, he gave it all. He bore it all. Every whip, every nail, every thorn that pressed in his flesh was Say that old man is dead. I'm gonna let go of the food. 
useless things. I'm going to let go of the senseless things. And I want to bury your teeth. If that is you this morning, I want you to come forward. I want you to come forward. If, if, if it's sin, I want you to come forward. If it's an anger issue, I want you to come forward. If it's rebellion, I want you to come forward. Whatever it is, if it's sickness that is holding you back, I want you to come forward. Whatever it is that you feel that is holding you back from reaching and marrying your destiny this morning, I need you to come to the altar and declare. Don't just come in here like a ritual. You have to come in believing, mentally and spiritually recognizing that that old man is dead. And it is no longer going to hold you back. It is no longer going to speak into your life. And now you are only going to allow God, the Almighty, to speak into your life. You're only going to speak, allow those that are going to be positive influences to speak into your life. Because you are fearfully and wonderfully made. God has a purpose for each and every one of you. Don't allow your sin, don't allow it a stumbling block to hold you back from your destiny. God wants you to be set free this morning. I'm going to ask Pastor Chris, Pastora, my wife, Edward, if you come help us pray. Pastor Claudia, I'm going to minister over these lives. If you're still there struggling, the hardest step is stepping out of your bed, stepping out of your comfort zone this morning. But let me tell you, the promise of God is true for your life. I'm going to tell you that. Declare the blood of Jesus. Declare the name of Jesus over your life. And the chains have to fall. The chains have to fall. They have no choice. A couple weeks ago, I talked about the false idol that the Philistines kept on setting up next to the presence of God. And no matter how they raised it up, it kept on falling. Nothing, nothing that is not of God can stand when the presence of God is present in your life. I want you to stand, church.